Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of our Speak Out series. My name is Rally Chakarova, and I'm the Executive Director of the Bull Foundation and the moderator for today's career discussion focusing on construction craft worker. The Bull Foundation has a very simple but important mission to inspire the next generation of construction professionals right here in the greater Toronto area. One way to do that is to ensure that young people have the information they need to choose a career that they're passionate about and can be successful in. This series facilitates discussions on the in-demand careers in construction and how young people can get started. Each panel is made up of industry professionals, including union reps, employers, and apprentices to provide useful insight into the education and training requirements, physical demands, what to expect day to day, and advancement opportunities within the specific construction career. I want to acknowledge and thank our series sponsors, RBC Future Launch, for their generous support of this important initiative to help close the information gap and get more youth interested in construction careers. Let's hear from our sponsors now. Hi everyone, my name is Mark Beckles and I'm the Vice President of Social Impact and Innovation here at RBC. Today, youth are the most unemployed age group in Canada with almost 800,000 young Canadians not currently in employment, education or training. Canada's skilled tradespeople that have long been the backbone of our economy are more critical than ever. And so is solving this sector's main challenges, the underrepresentation of women and immigrants, the need to double down on digital training, and the ongoing stigmas around trades careers. And while these challenges are significant, so are the opportunities. Through the RBC Future Launch partnership with Bolt, we aim to ensure that you understand what opportunities are available in the skilled trades industry and how to get started in a career that you are passionate about. Because at RBC, we see a future in your future. Today's discussion focuses on careers as a construction craft worker. Commonly referred to as a general laborer, this is a very versatile role that includes different skills, sectors, and growth opportunities. We have a fantastic industry panel here to dive into that discussion. So without further ado, let's meet them. Lisa, let's start with you. Please tell us about your role, organization, and how you got started in this career. Thank you, Raleigh. Happy to be here. My name is Lisa Price, and I am the manager of construction skills and apprenticeship programs here at the Layuna Local 183 Training Center. We are the training center, sorry, excuse me, the training arm of the largest construction union uh, in North America, Local 183. We have just over 60,000 members. Uh, we provide health and safety training, uh, construction skills training, and apprenticeship training in four uh, different apprenticeships. We focus on the voluntary trades rather than compulsory trades. And we also offer a host of construction uh, skills programs as well that are non-apprenticeship related. I actually got started as a special projects manager about 12 years ago. I sort of did a little bit of odds and ends here at the training center and then eventually moved into my role as manager of the programs. I have been uh, privileged to work with in partnerships with yourself as well as some of our school boards across the province um, to get young people into the trades. And uh, we partner with the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship um, programs throughout three different boards currently working on two more. Um, so we try to bring as many young people into the programs as we can and, and get them out working in the trades. Well, that's fantastic. Thanks so much. Sante, we'll go over to you. Yes, uh, thank you for having me here, by the way, Rally. Um, my name is Sante Paglia, and I am a director uh, with the Straw Construction Group. Uh, the Straw Construction Group is a high-rise residential former company, and we do buildings in the greater Toronto area. There is a tremendous need for, uh, for manpower or, or laborers or, or carpenters for everything. And at this point, people don't seem to understand the, the opportunity that's there um, for young workers wanting to get into the industry. Um, it, there's shortages uh, that are uh, unheard of. There's so much work out there that companies can't even tender them because they don't have the, man, the, the, the personnel to do them. Um, so it's extremely vital that something like this uh, is heard by many people and understand that this is a viable career opportunity for many, especially if you're not, you know, if you haven't even gone through an education stream of any kind. Because you, a lot of the, the, the things you need to learn, you actually learn while you're on site. 
Um, with respect to myself, um, I started working in construction in 1986. Um, you know, I, I did so uh, in my summers um, while I was attending university and high school. And in, it, in uh, I'm actually a CPA, CGA by trade. In 2001, I started working at the CIP group where I learned to kind of manage companies and manage manpower and all that good stuff. And then in 2014, the straw construction group was born and we've been going at it ever since, growing every year and in desperate, desperate need of quality people to, you know, join us uh, on our, you know, putting up these buildings. That's it. Thank you so much, Sante. Couldn't agree more. Uh, Nicole, we'll go over to you. Hi, my name is Nicole Borland. Um, I'm a construction uh, worker. I'm a laborer with 506. I'm a second year apprentice. Um, I started in a completely different field. Um, had no experience in construction, but was interested in it. Um, it was introduced in my high school, but I, back then, not that they discouraged women and girls to join it, but um, my personal experience, I just didn't feel comfortable going into it and didn't seem um, like a viable career for a woman at that time. Um, my first career, I decided that I was done. I burnt out um, and I was looking for something different and I knew I always wanted to work with my hands. Um, my father's in the trades, he's a mechanic. So I know that it's a viable career, but I had to visualize that for myself. Um, obviously being younger than him and being a woman. Um, I got into construction by doing informational interviews. Um, after college, university and graduate school, when I was looking for jobs, I always interviewed people who had the job that I wanted. When I was transitioning to construction, I felt that it should be no different. I should do the research on my own first and talk to people who are in it. Um, and that's kind of how I came to Lionel you know, 506. I talked to somebody who asked what I was interested in, um, what trade specifically, and I said I didn't know, and he told me to look into Laina. Because of being a general laborer, you do get so much experience and you get a lot of exposure to different trades and different things that you can either stay with Laina or you could transfer to something else. I'm very happy where I am, and I love being able to do different things. Um, in the last two years, I've done a, couple, a lot of different things. I think we'll get into that with the other questions. Um, but yeah, again, I'm a second year apprentice. I enjoy it. Um, I think I agree that there is a lot of work out there. Um, and if you're young or even if you're old, I think it is a good career. And by old, I mean just able-bodied, but not a teenager. Well, thank you so much. And you made such a good point. And that's why we're so thrilled that you can join us today because other women should be able to see themselves in these careers uh, that are so rewarding. And again, so much demand out there. Uh, Sean will uh, wrap up their introductions uh, with you. Thanks, Riley. Uh, I'm Sean McCaffrey. I'm a general superintendent with Delterra, which is uh, the general contracting division of Tridel, our parent company, I guess. So uh, I've been with the company 20, almost 27 years now. I was a graduate of George Brown in the uh, late 80s. And uh, similar to Sante, I kind of grew up in a family business. So it was uh, through osmosis, always, exper uh, always exposed to uh, kind of uh, the industry and just uh, went to school for it, obviously, and then uh, managed to uh, work. I worked in housing for five years, low rise housing, uh, custom housing, which was a great uh, eye opener and a kind of a precursor to a career in high-rise construction, which I picked the, the best time, uh, I think, in, in decades to get into high-rise construction in the, in the 90s, right? So it's been uh, steady, uh, steady employment, steady uh, growing and learning, and uh, the industry is evolving over the, over the decades as well. We've become very professional in our, uh, our health and safety and just our experience and uh, kind of world-renowned, I think, in Canada for the, for the work that we do. Right, we're we're very famous worldwide. Whenever you go, whenever you travel, everybody talks about the Canadians and the Toronto, the even Toronto centric, uh, the industry that we have here. Right, we're very uh, very good at what we do, and it's a it's a growing industry. And just as busy as we are with the number, I think uh, John Tory said this morning that there's 205 cranes up in the city. So, 
uh, one of the largest in the world for cranes and we're, we're making it work. And every year we, we just say, you know, when we're at capacity, we're at capacity, but we just keep adding and adding and adding to it. And Sante can say like, it would just, I don't know, we're making it work and we're constantly in need of uh, new, new people to join the industry. Right. There's, there's uh, there's always a, a, a turnover of, you know, the experienced hands and handing the reins over to the younger generations, right? And, and we always manage to keep it, keep it going and people are learning and people rise to the top and, you know, the hard workers and the ones who want to succeed, they do. There's nothing holding them up from doing that. So it's a great, great industry and a great time to get into it as well. So. Absolutely. And what a great segue for us to dig deeper into this particular career and how it can be a, a sort of a, a jumping start into many other ones that I think Nicole alluded to already. Um, so Lisa, we'll go back to you and let's just start with the basics. Uh, we'd love to hear just an overview of what a construction craft worker is and what they may find themselves doing on site. Um, and if you wanna highlight some of the benefits uh, maybe of working in that trade. Sure. Um, again, Nicole did touch on that. And, and, and the biggest thing I'd say with a construction craft worker is diversity and being able to work in many different areas of construction. Um, tasks would include anything from as um, the initial clean prep site uh, to before a job starts to the cleanup after a job is finished. But there's so much in between. Um, there's form work that happens. There's uh, setting up scaffolding. There's working small machines. There's um, they even do some masonry work, steel working with wood. So there's a range, a broad scope that construction craft workers um, really cover throughout their training. So it's a broad spectrum apprenticeship and really gives that initial um, stepping stone, as you mentioned, to sort of getting into the construction industry. It's a good place for whether it's even, you know, young people who have no experience or individuals as a second career, where they're saying, you know what, I've, I've done this for, for quite some time, much like Nicole mentioned. And now I, I know that I want to work with my hands. I want to be leaving a mark on the infrastructure of the province. So what can I do? And construction craft workers is a good place uh, to start because you can move quite uh, fluidly throughout the industry. So you're not sort of tied to one particular job throughout your career. You're able to really move in different sectors in different areas. You could move across the province. Uh, you know, there's lots of options. So it, it really is a general uh, baseline to sort of get that initial start in the construction industry. Um, and they, they can do anything on site, anything from, like I said, site preparation to doing some form work, to putting up scaffolding, to moving materials, to prepping materials, to cleaning up once the job is done, uh, you know, building bridges. Uh, so the vast array of tasks are just are really endless. Thank you. And, and I love the leaving a mark on infrastructure, because I think one of the coolest things about being in this industry is being able to, you know, walk down the street, point to a building and say, I helped build that. Uh, it's just, uh, I get goosebumps every time I say that. So it's a, it's a very cool factor. Uh, so Nicole, let's hear uh, more from you. So can you be more specific about what your typical day-to-day -day looks like as an apprentice? Uh, what type of work have you been doing and um, what type of sites? Yeah, I'll start from when I started, I was working for a general construction company. And like Lisa said, it's prepping um, for the other trades to start the work. So that meant from sweeping to mainly, I guess, in the beginning, a lot of sweeping um, to cleaning. Uh, it was a water treatment center. So you're prepping, you know, you're pumping a lot of water um, and then sweeping some more um, to even excavating in this case, it was a lot of copper pipes and then cutting them down to size and sending them away um, or, you know, tearing up um, insulation from around the pipes that they can put in the new ones. Um, the second side I worked at, I actually have my swamping ticket. So I was a swamper apprentice. Um, so like you talked about working with a lot of cranes, there were four tower cranes there. So that that was an experience. I really enjoy swamping. Um, cranes aren't as scary as they seem if you've never been on a site before. I think just communication really helps. But even when you're not swamping, you're making sure that things are stacked, that you have everything ready for the crane to just come and pick it up because it is still a job and it still has to be done on a time. Um, you know, the crane moves as quickly as it can, but it's the people on the ground that make it, everyone around it safe. Um, but also you want to do it efficiently. So um, 
as a swamp or apprentice, I was just blowing the hell out of my whistle, making sure people were away, um, out of the way or aware that the crane was moving, talking to the crane operator, um, you know, hooking things up uh, with straps before the crane got there and just kind of mapping out where things are going to go and talking to the different cranes and the other and the different trades, making sure that they can get their lifts as well. Um, and that was with a uh, forming company. So then stripping forms, um, getting materials for the carpenters, um, and even helping with the concrete. Um, my current place now, I've done two things with them. I've built scaffold, um, like again, like Lisa was saying, so building and tearing down and sorting. And now I'm with the mason part of this company. And so now I'm a mason tender. So within two years, I've done an array of things. I was going to say, hey, I remember you saying it's only been two years. So yeah. you've, you've worked a lifetime. Oh, and, just, <laughs> and just for our audience that may be not familiar with what a swamper is, and mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people are interested in being crane operators and don't realize that you tend to start as a swamper on the ground to make sure that you learn all the ins and outs. You don't just climb into the cab and start mm -hmm. operating cranes all around the city. So again, talking about the advancement opportunities, if you were interested in, in going into one field or another, uh, that was a great overview. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Sanjay, we'll come to you as an employer on this side. Can you tell us a little bit about the type of duties that general laborers do on straw construction sites and what skills someone should have to be successful in this trade? Let me preface what I'm going to say with this. If you look at a, a duck on a pond, the duck looks so serene. It looks like there's no movement, looks like there's no motion. Then underneath, you don't realize that his legs are kicking to keep everything going, but he looks so smooth and serene. That's what a general laborer is to the construction site. The general labor is everything. Because the general labor, labor can do everything, as these very intelligent ladies have already stated. Because at the end of the day, without the general labor, you cannot do any of the things to push the production of the job. Carpenters need equipment and material. It has to get delivered to them. Material has to be erected and dismantled. Okay, There's all kinds of stuff that has to happen. Material has to be cleaned because you got to keep reusing it. You can't keep ordering it, keep ordering it, keep ordering it. It doesn't work like that. Material has to be clean. And, you know, there's so there, it's a lot of work that needs to go into what a laborer does on a day to day basis. But it's important for certain, certain skills. They have to be able to time management a little bit. They have to be able to take a little bit of direction. But at the same time, they have to be able to work on their own because once they're given a task, they, the task needs to get done. So, you know, and then the other part of it, which was also touched on, is a safety aspect. Because safety is is an ongoing ongoing living thing at all times, and everyone is responsible. So, but part of it is with the housekeeping and cleaning. You have to keep keep your work area clean, and you have to keep your work area safe. And oftentimes, it is the general laborer that does this. I, I'll tell you, people don't realize how important that position is to construction. And understand this: we are all we are our, all my guys are unionized. One eighty three or seven ninety three. Seven ninety three is the crane operators and 183 is a labor. There are different classifications within the laborers union, but they are all laborers. Carpenters are laborers, you know, swampers are laborers, steelmen are laborers. Everybody's a labor first, and they, they become something from that. And that's very important in our company, and I'm sure in many of the other ones as well. No, those are very, very good points, kind of the glue that holds uh, holds it all together. Uh, Sean, we'll come to you again from for the employer perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, is this any different uh, from trade out? Because I think a lot of people may not be familiar that um, a company like Delterra or Tridel would hire laborers directly. So if you can uh, speak a little bit about what their duties are on site, and then maybe get a little bit into the uh, what the physical, um, I guess, requirements are, if there's strength or endurance. Uh, that's required uh, for what they do on site. Okay, so as, as usual, Sante and I are we're kind of on the same belief because uh, for him to do his job properly, the general contractor, which is us, we need to provide him with certain fundamentals that allow him to uh, fulfill his contract. So we need to, like as an example, this time of year, uh, the weather is getting cold. We need to be planning ahead for winter protection, for heating the, con the concrete 
when you're 400 feet up in the air, it's, it's very chilly up there. So we need to, we can't afford to have down days because we didn't plan and organize and have the heaters running when Sante needs to pour, us, pour the concrete, right? So we need, we're, uh, we have our laborers working on that now. So that right now there's teams of guys up doing tarping and winter heaters. We train, we'll train our, uh, our, uh, our workers in uh, propane, natural gas, how to, how to, how to properly heat, heat a building, right? It's a, it's a, it's an art. It's a, it's a, it's a science end and like it's a it's you know you're heating these huge massive structures up in the air and you have to again you can't afford any downtime because you weren't organized and you weren't planned so we have teams of laborers that are constantly just doing that and then as soon as sante is done and we're, we're flying the forms which the table forms up to the next floor we're in behind uh, like we're like sante was saying with safety we were in we're the first guys in installing the safety fences to make it safe for everybody else to work so there's a huge burden there's a there's a huge responsibility on our on our workers so uh, and then again there's uh the, the, to uh to, to further with nicole the sweeping part of there, there's that's another i my first job was sweeping my my father taught me how to sweep and it wasn't I, you know I, I used to regret it oh i have to go sweep but now yeah, looking back on it he was teaching me how to organize the job and how to how to plan and think and think ahead and keep the job moving by keeping it clean and keeping the workers safe and I actually know this uh, quite famous gentleman in the city who likes to come to job sites and sweep at, uh, you know, up in the forming, uh, forming uh, part of it too. But uh, he's world renowned. He, you know, and he's uh, quite a successful businessman, and he still comes and sweeps the sweeps the floors every day, which is incredible. But it just tells you that it's 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 uh, you know you become the when you you get your job and they put you on a sweeping. It's not. It's not that they're teaching you how to sweep, they're teaching you how to think and how to be organized and, and uh, be dedicated too, because they're going to put you through the ringer, right? They're going to want to see if you've got what it takes and, and sweeping and doing a great job is, is the first stepping stone in that too, right? So, Absolutely. And I think both of you highlighted two really good points is that, um, and Lisa, I'll, I'll come to you to talk a little bit more about the apprenticeships in a moment, but it is that it's, you know, you're, you're starting from... I don't want to say the bottom, but the basics, and then you're you're working your way up uh, on that. And then I think the other part that a lot of people don't realize in construction is the importance of teamwork. That you know it is it is a system, and without you doing your job, you're preventing others from doing their job, and you know it all it all falls apart. And I think that's a that's those are really really great points uh, to make. So. Uh, Lisa, I think you mentioned a little bit about uh, the beginning about compulsory versus voluntary. I think we're using, you know, words like apprenticeship. Um, so I'd love for you to unpack these um, these uh, terms a little bit for us and explain what an apprenticeship is and what some of the ben benefits of that training approach might be. Absolutely. So uh, an apprenticeship is really a system for, for training a new individual in, uh, in a particular profession or a trade. Um, typically what happens is uh, an employer will hire on an individual as an apprentice. They will do on the job training. So they'll learn the majority of the tasks on the job with a portion of that being in class where they go to a training provider, you know, such as the 183 training center where they come in, they're going to register with the province of Ontario, they're going to be considered a registered apprentice, which means that they have a signed training agreement indicating that they have made a commitment to this training program, much as they would a college program, where they've said, listen, I'm going to set aside whether it's a two year program or a three year or multi level program, the majority of the apprenticeships are multi level. And so they will make that commitment and sign that agreement. Also, there's another way to go about it where, for example, the way we run most of our programs, we recruit uh, from you know, the outside world. Some individuals have no construction experience. Some of them come to us from some of our employer partners that have already been hired on as an apprentice, but now need to do their in-class training, which is really coming to our training center and doing eight weeks or 10 weeks of hands-on training. So they'll go through all of the learning outcomes uh, that are noted in the construction craft worker program, which is provincially uh, set out by, uh, it was initially the College of Trades, now it's Skilled Trades Ontario. So we work with that curriculum to deliver that training. 
the apprentice would then either return back to the company that they were hired on with to then fulfill that on-site training piece, or we would assist them with finding placement um, with some of our signatory contractors at 183. Uh, and the benefit of this is that these individuals are getting a safe space to learn some of the skills that they need. So perhaps for those individuals who are not coming from a construction background or perhaps have not had a chance to be on site, um, typically if they come to us without having that experience, they're able to make errors in our training center safely. They're able to ask questions and we're able to sort of prep them for what that job site is going to look like because our instructors are foremen, they've been site supervisors, they've been in the industry for a long time. So they're really invested in what happens to these apprentices. And even individuals who have construction experience and are coming to us from a referred company, um, they still wanna build that certification. They wanna say, you know, I am a construction craft worker, Red Seal, I'm gonna work through my trade and I wanna be certified. And even though it's a compulsory trade, as I mentioned, which, uh, sorry, I apologize, a voluntary trade, uh, there is still an exam at the end of the apprenticeship. So the compulsory trades is where you have a license like a plumber, an electrician, and you have to keep up that license. Uh, but in the voluntary trade, like a construction craft, craft worker, there's not a formal license, but there is still a final red seal exam that you would uh, write and pass to become a journey person. That is a fantastic explanation. Thank you so much. Uh, Nicole, we'll come to you. Um, we'd love to hear your plan since you are in your second year and what your experience has been like that uh, with the apprenticeship so far and, and what you're thinking about um, in terms of next steps. But also we'd love to hear what your sort of highlights are for the job and what some of the challenges might be. Yeah, I definitely want to get my red seal and become a journey person. Um, I thought I would join as a construction craft worker and work with different trades and be like, okay, that's it. I want to be a pipe fitter. And that hasn't happened. Um, I was surprised at first, um, but now I'm actually really comfortable sitting in the fact that I can do different things and I'm picking up a lot of different skills. Um, the best part, I think, would be picking up those skills and learning different things. Um, doing my training at um, the training center, I'm, they obviously continue to say, you're going to use this, you're going to use it. It may not be the first year, it may not be the second. But as I've been through so many sites and done so many jobs, I can say I've used almost all of it. Um, yeah, I would say all of it, including being in confined spaces, which I didn't think was going to happen as soon as it did. So it it made me feel comfortable when they asked, have you done this before? I would say no, but I did do it in training. I do feel comfortable. Let's go through the safety. I'm ready, let's go. Um, so I think the best part of being a construction craft worker um, besides the training is getting the opportunity to use that training, um, working with a foreman or a foreperson who will give you the chance, will take the time to teach you. Um, and just some of the people that you meet on site, um, a lot of them are, I don't want to say willing to show you things because I don't want to say that just because I'm a woman, they're like, let me show you how to do this. They're like that with, when I say that they're like this with all the apprentices, they just want to show you how to do it because they want you to help them. They want you to be successful because they want to get the job done. They may be a journey person and they just don't want to slow down. So they're going to show you accurately so you can continue to flow and you'll know for next time. Um, the most challenging part I think would be communication. And I say that with the different generations and I don't necessarily mean the older generation in construction. I'm talking about the younger ones that are constantly on their phone, are not aware of the safety that's going on, you know, walking around site with holes and things. And they're just looking down. Like I, the amount of times I had to pull other apprentices, you know, by their harness because they're gonna fall or, you know, clap my hands or blow a whistle to be like, I need you to pay attention. Um, that would be challenging. Just communication between the different generations. And I think at least what I've noticed on site, you really notice 10 years difference in age. You really, really see it. Um, but because of my, um, my experience in my other jobs, I'm able to be aware of that. And like, we're talking about sweeping and time management. I've I felt like I had transferable skills by working in corporate to bring the construction. Um, it's just more hands-on. I'm able to use the words, you know, the buzzwords that we use in corporate to get a project done by giving like an actual example with my hands and using my words. But 
that would be a challenge, I think. Absolutely. I love I love that. And it sounds like you're well positioned to go into health and safety <laughs> if, you, if you'd like a career there as well. Uh, Sanjay, we'll come to you. Um, a lot of uh, our audience is wondering what the hours are like. So can you speak a little bit about, um, you know, what time does the day start? When does it finish? How many days a week? Uh, what does that look like for apprentices or journey persons? Well, of course, our, our typical work week is considered 40, 40 hours. And generally, we usually start uh, at, at 7 a.m. and go till like 3. You usually get a half hour for lunch. You get two 10-minute breaks, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And that's typically standard for most companies. If you work uh, anything over eight hours, it's time and a half. And uh, sometimes you work on the weekend, on a Saturday usually, it's a uh, time and a half as well. Um, understand, though, that, you know, if it's raining, um, no one will force you to work. If it's too cold, no one will force you to work. If it's too hot, no one will force you to work. That's entirely up to the worker. So the site might work, but if the worker doesn't feel comfortable working in, in the rain or working in the snow or working when it's too cold or when it's too hot, then, you know, then they don't have to, obviously. That's entirely self-directed and you determine for yourself what you want to do. So you have some control in, in, that, uh, in that stead. So it's a consistent work now like the issue with construction before used to be it was cyclical but it hasn't been cyclical in the, in the last seven eight years for sure so we work all year round you know you don't produce as much in the winter but you got to learn you know to dress properly you got to learn you know when you know you got to learn you know if you're starting to feel too cold or whatever you gotta there's certain things you got to learn as a you know what your your body can tolerate and as you get older i guess i guess guys tolerate more because the old diet guys they seem to never be cold they seem to never be warm they you know they just keep going but you know it's entirely up to the, the person that's that's the way it works with us anyway well, that's great. Thank you. And I think uh, some people might be like 7 a.m. That's crazy. But uh, the fact that you get to finish early and especially in the GTA, beat the rush hour, <laughs> leave before uh, it starts and on both sides, I think that's uh, an added bonus. Uh, Sean, uh, let's go over to you. Uh, this is another question that came from the audience. Does someone need experience to get started in this role um, or can they learn as they go well for an apprentice obviously we look for just uh you know key indicators like willingness to learn and just a, a, the attitude and uh, energetic right to, to want to learn so that's uh that's what we look for not so much experience experience will come right and and that will come as fast as that person embraces it right like the people who are eager to work and always want to be there on time or be early and just and, and be a sponge and, and just learn people will open up as nicole was saying people will open up if they if they see an apprentice that shows interest and keenness they're gonna they're gonna take that extra time to to show them the, the thing so you you're, you're do you need experience no are you going to get experience based on your on your aptitude and your attitude and your willingness to learn yes of course some people are going to get it very quickly and other people, so, you know, it's, it might take a little bit, a little bit longer, but uh, it's all, it's all attitude and willingness to learn. So. All right. So it's more important to be on time there at 7 a.m. Or, or earlier, bring yeah. a positive attitude, be willing to learn. Yeah. That, that being on time and being showing up every day, that opens more doors than any experience. <laughs> well, that's great for anyone who's looking to get started. Definitely. Uh, Thank you. Lisa, we'll come back to you for a very popular question, uh, the money. <laughs> so do you mind telling us a little bit about what the pay structure looks like, what the average starting salary is, and then what the earning potential uh, may be as people gain more experience and advance in this trade? So I know that this is a huge question. I know that the, the money question comes from all of my young apprentices. They're like, you know, how much money am I going to make? And I always tell them the money will come. You just be a good worker and that money is going to come. So um, typically in an apprenticeship, because, for example, at 183, uh, from, you know, the various uh, sectors of construction that we cover, there's like 26 sectors of construction and each has a collective agreement. And within that collective agreement, there's different pay scales and structures based on the job that that individual does. Um, because I loved what Sante said about, you know, the labor is, you're, you're a laborer, but then your skill level or just sort of where you fall with the particular job that you do, that rate of pay changes with that skill set or perhaps, you know, how how quickly you advance in that job and on that site. So typically an apprenticeship will start usually 60% of what a full journey person's rate would be. 
Um, to give a dollar amount, I would say the majority of my apprentices start in that high 20s, mid 20s uh, range. So they, they do pretty well for a young person just starting out. They're also going to be union members, which is going to give them that full package of all the benefits that come with that as well. So it is, um, it's more than just what they see on that initial dollar amount. And then based on if they move up on the site, if the employer likes them, uh, sometimes they don't stick to the collective agreements, which is a great thing, because if they're getting paid more, that's always wonderful. Um, and, and I think that if you don't want to get bogged down too much about chasing, you know, a dollar here, a dollar there, because you will move up. Some collective agreements are quite structured where you need to complete, let's say, your second level of apprenticeship uh, before you can move to a next rate of pay. And then you may have to then write your final red seal exam and become a journey person to move to that top level. But it really depends on the collective agreement and sort of what arrangements are made with that employer and, and how that all works on site. Some people may get top rate right out of right out of the gate, which could be somewhere in the high 40s. So it, it really does depend. Well, I mean, no experience in getting started 25 to 29 dollars an hour is uh, is a pretty strong start. <laughs> I yeah, would say. Very well, that's great. Thank you so much. And I know we talked, we touched a little bit about the advancement opportunities. So that whole idea about, you know, jumping into different careers. So, uh, Sean, I'd love to bring it back to you. Uh, I'm sure you've seen many construction craft workers and general laborers in your extensive experience in the field. What are some of the advancements opportunities that you've seen people starting as general laborers? And then where have they gone after that? And what does that look like? A lot of uh, the advancement, you can uh, become like a lead. You can start leading a team of once you've gained enough experience. Obviously, once your apprenticeship's over and you've got some years of uh, experience under your belt, you could become a lead or a foreman. Uh, you could also even go into uh, uh, a lot of guys also go get into forming or into other other trades as well. Right. It's a, it's a great uh, door opening kind of. Like Nicole, you, you learn different things. You get to see what you want and what, what areas you can get into. Because we, our, 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 uh, our, uh, our workers, they, they, they do everything. They, from, from excavations to shoring to, to forming to, there, there's, in the, in the natural course of a project alone, you know, you're, you're going from excavation to finished product. So you're into handyman in the suites doing painting and touch-ups. And there's, there's a little bit of something for everybody, right? That's, uh, you, you once you gain that initial experience you the possibilities are quite endless right to what you can get yourself into that's amazing sante i'd love to bring you into this question as well and and get more specifics on your end of what you've seen in your experience i can honestly say this every one of my foremen started off as something else every one of my layout men started off as something else Every one of my crane operators started off as something else. What I mean by that is my crane operators start off as oilers, swampers, and then became crane operators. My foremen, they became foremen, maybe some of them were general laborers, some of them were carpenters, in which case they became a carpenter after being a laborer. So there's all kind of opportunity to move up. It's entirely up to the person. If the person wants to take advantage of the situation, they can. What I would say is in order to move to a more managerial position, I would say a general labor should learn to read the drawings. If they do that, they open up a whole other world. You open up the layout side, and then you, you open up, you know, potentially getting into the management side. Now, if you're a good carpenter, you can have four or five people working under you. And you, you, know, you give them a little area, and they work. And that's how we operate, because the job is so big. There are so many people on a job. One foreman cannot keep, keep an eye on everybody. So you have, this is what you have to do. And if you promote from within, which is what we do, it shows everybody there's always an opportunity to better yourself. And that's why we do what we do. I'll tell you, a lot of the guys that I have that are in my key positions have been with me for like 20 years. And that's the God honest truth. I'm not making this up. This is something heartfelt. And I mean this. You start to something, you finish to something else. And this is very, very possible and achievable for anybody if they want it. It's up to them. Well, I really love this. And I'm going to just dig deeper into this and stress this point, because I think this is such a unique proposition compared to many of the other apprenticeships and skill trades that are there. Because as Lisa mentioned, in the compulsory trades like electrical, plumbing, sheet metal, you have to stick it out. You know, that that's sort of the 
um, the idea for you to become licensed and actually, you know, uh, be making that that high endpoint. But what I really love about this trade is that the world is your oyster, as they say, because if you wanted to jump into a different trade that you like more, even on the management side, there's absolutely an opportunity to do that. And you're not being disadvantaged at that point as you're making that career move. And I think that, again, I just really want to highlight this point because it's a, it's a really important one and a really unique one for this particular uh, trade as we discuss. Uh, Nicole, I'd love to come back to you and uh, unpack something that you said in your intro, and that's about being a woman in this trade and a woman in construction period. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what your experience has been like in this profession. And really importantly, if you would recommend this as a career option to other women. I would start by saying about the um, recommending it, I would say yes. Um, kind of what everyone touched on and what makes a good construction construction worker or construction craft worker would be the same, whether you're a man or a woman. You have to be willing to do the work, willing to learn, willing to show up on time. Um, I wouldn't say get into it just because you're a woman and you're like, I just want to do it and, you know, whatever. Do it because you want to do it and it is a, a great job to do. Um, so, yes, plain and simple, I would recommend it. Um, I would also say, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, me personally, if I can't carry something, I know I can't, I'm not gonna try to prove anything to anyone. And I don't think any other man should do the same. And a lot of them don't, nobody wants to get hurt. Um, my experience, I don't wanna discredit any women who, or anyone who's talked to any woman who has a bad experience, but I haven't had any. Um, I think that comes down to, or part of it could be personality um, a part of it could be I'm not afraid to talk to new people I'm not afraid to speak up um, I I haven't had any bad experiences there's been miscommunications like I said communication would be a challenge but communication doesn't have to turn into yelling and screaming and derogatory comments about sex or gender or race or anything um, you can argue with someone you know move on from it get the job done safely say goodnight, you know, or even thank you. Like we got through it. Um, my experience, yeah, my experience has, be, has been fine. Um, from talking to other women, I feel like we have similar experiences in terms of it being good, but I just think you have to be able to know your limit. Don't be afraid to ask for help um, and speak up for yourself like you would in any, any other job. Um, if, you know, if, I don't know how to say it. I guess if you see something, say something. Or, if you're, or in terms of if they're they're giving you a job and you don't know how to do it, ask how. Ask before, because not only can you get hurt if you're working with somebody else, another apprentice, you both can get hurt. Um, yeah, I think my own experience is with working other apprentice, apprentices, whether they be younger or older than me or the older generation or younger generation, um, I find a lot of men won't ask for help. And so I, you know, was a quick story I was asking an apprentice if he knows how to use the skill saw or a saw to cut rebar and he was like yeah sure and just his face not being sure I was like you don't know <laughs> I'm going to show you because they asked us to do it and now I'm respond now we're responsible for each other so I think when I say speak up and say something it's that if someone says yeah and you feel like they don't know how to do it and if you don't know how to do it then you can go back and ask someone. I'm not afraid to ask for help because then I'll know how to do it properly, appropriately, and it will only get faster, which means you'll just get better at your job. Um, so yeah, again, I'd recommend it. My experiences have been great. Um, like I said, I'm not afraid to, to talk to everybody on site, but also not in a social way, like in, I'm still getting my work done in, in terms of that, but I felt safe and I feel safe because I know the names and faces of a lot of people that I've already said good morning to that I've seen around site and then I can ask for help if need be. Well, I love that because again, you highlighted a lot of important aspects of the trade and of just having a positive experience. I mean, it's been great to see more women enter in this industry, which is one part of it, but also again, highlighting those foundational skills. I know Sean already mentioned, you know, willing to learn positive attitude, uh, be early, but you also said, you know, your communication, not being afraid to ask questions, ask for help, be realistic about those 
those are, you know, not really gendered <laughs> skill sets or technical in any way. So I think uh, a lot of women would find success in these types of roles. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you. Um, I think we have a really great idea about how versatile this role is, what the opportunities are with this profession. So now I'd love to change the conversation into how do interested people get here? Um, so Lisa, I'll come back to you. Uh, what do you look for when you're assessing new applicants to start their training with uh, LIUNA 183? Are there any basic requirements? Do they need a high school diploma? If you can give us some of the specifics here. Sure. Uh, we here look for a driver's license. It's very important um, because construction is, you know, all over the place. You're, you're not always going to be next door to your house. It may not be accessible by transit. So we do prefer that the individual does have a driver's license or working towards a license and has a vehicle. Um, I know sometimes certain companies will maybe pick up an individual or say, if you can meet us here, you know, we may have a pickup spot, uh, but we don't know that when we're recruiting. So we try to recruit uh, individuals who do have, have licenses and vehicles, but we will make a exceptions if we think that the candidate is, um, you know, outstanding and, and has a real strong drive to be in the trades. We'll see how we can work around that. We do that really for our employer's benefit because sometimes they'll say, well, they need to have a car. How do we go about doing this now that this individual can't get around? So that is one of the requirements. Um, most of our trades are looking for grade 10 um, component. So we would ask that they show at least completion of grade 10 transcripts. Uh, we do have one apprenticeship, which is our tractor loader backhoe, which does ask for a grade 12. Um, so that's sort of the educational requirements that we look for. We also have uh, sort of an entrance exam that we ask each potential apprentice to write. Um, it's based at a grade, uh, sorry, a grade 10 level, and it's, you know, literacy and math, just getting a sense of, of where they fall uh, in their understanding of those basic components. And really just to um, echo what Sean and Sante had, had noted is that we look for an individual who has a drive and a motivation to be in the trades, whether there's experience or not, they really understand what trade they're getting into. They understand for, from our perspective, who the laborers are, what it means to be a construction craft worker, what opportunities are presented to you as a construction craft worker. We do interviews to assess where they'd like to see themselves because sometimes they may indicate that they want to do a job that we don't necessarily provide that training for. So we want to ensure that the candidates know exactly where they're coming uh, and, and understanding that it's, you know, early mornings, long days sometimes, uh, and that there's a dedication and, and really that they're just ready to work. And once we see, I mean, you can only judge uh, so much during an interview. Uh, we hope we make good decisions uh, for our employer partners, but that's that's really what we're looking for is, is someone who understands the trade and, and really knows what they're getting themselves into, that there's, you know, weather components, you're going to be in heat, you're going to be in cold, you're going to be tired, your body's going to feel different than it normally would being in an office or in a, you know, working at a coffee shop or in a restaurant. So just, just really understand the physical components and having a love for working with their hands and, and, and being in a trade. I think that was a great summary, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Sean and Sante. Anything else to add in terms of what you look for when you uh, hire new apprentices? Uh, for us, it's more, see, people always come to the job and they say that they can do this, they can do that. So what we take a more pragmatic approach, we actually put people to work. And part of that is seeing how they work in a team, how they take direction, and if they show up every day, which is extremely, extremely important for us. You can be a very good worker, but if you come once, twice a week, you're completely useless to us because we need someone's going to be there every day. And then the other part, because it was stressed that, you know, you stressed that I believe it was rally that's we're a team here. You got to be able, you know, especially when you're you're young and you're learning, you need to be able to take direction from others and you need to be able to take correction. And so that's the only way you're going to learn. You know, I'm going to tell you the 90% of what's going on is learned on site with hands-on training with hopefully patient, but often impatient people. And that's another thing. You see how they behave or react to other impatient people. It tells a lot about a person's character. And so at the end of the day, it's not a perfect, uh, you know, not a perfect science or whatnot. But, you know, if you come every day and you show an aptitude or wanting to work, we give you the opportunity. Amazing. Uh, Sean, anything else on your head to add? 
Uh, very similar strains. Like, we, um, it, it's a little catch twenty two because we we need to, we because we're signatory with the unions. We have to hire uh, one eighty three or seven ninety three. So we we need people who are already enrolled with the union uh, before we can start putting them to work. But also, and that same note, we need them to know that if they're or if we're going to assist them getting in the union, uh, getting enrolled, that they're going to same thing, show up every day and and be hardworking and start contributing to, you know. Uh, contributing to our, our work environment. You know, we plan time is money. We need, you know, we make plans days and days and weeks and months in advance. We need to know that we have a reliable workforce that we can follow through on our, our commitment. So we need people to show up and, and, um, and also they don't, you know, you don't want them to be a burden on, on their coworkers and on, also on the union as well. Right. So uh, that, that's the key. And I, I hate to stress it, or I can, I have to stress it. You have to, you have to be willing to work. You have to want to show up and, and again, we do have to be enrolled with the union as well before we can hire you. But uh... that's a, that's a great point. So I will also summarize that just to say that you do have to be uh, signed on as a member with either Leuna 183 or Leuna 506 to get started. Now, uh, just a question for the group: Whoever wants to take the, is there like a trial period, or is that the first step that people uh, need to do to get started? Is there a way to kind of start with an employer for a month or a couple of weeks before you sign on with the union or does it start with the union? Sanjay, I saw, I saw that you unmuted, so I'll go over to you. Well, you know, oftentimes what'll happen with us is we usually, with the, with the union reps we talk to, we, they give us usually a week's grace. And then in a week's time, if the queer worker is gonna be there, we get them to sign up and away we go. That's how it works. Because uh, oftentimes times are different than they used to be before. They used to send you the people. Now there's no one to send you. So you got to kind of, you know, like everyone's trying all kinds of different things in order to get people here to work. So at, at the end of the day, you know, it's a lot of trial and error. That's why you have a lot of guys that come and go. They work one or two days and then and then they're gone. It's unfortunate, but, you know, it's not an easy job, guys. Like, let's be serious. It's, you get a stigma from the beginning when you're in school telling you you should be a lawyer, an accountant or a doctor. They all poo-poo being in a trade. Okay. It's and the environment is not nice. It's hot. It's cold. People aren't nice to you all the time because you're working with an aging, uh, you know, workforce that they're not quite so patient anymore. It, and it's hard to make that look good sometimes. And the truth of the matter is it's extremely lucrative, uh, you know, profession. And it's very respectful, pro, 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 you know, profession. And you can live very comfortably, you and your family, with especially when you take into account union dues and the the union, uh, the pension, and you know your medical and your dental and your all covered and all that good stuff. It's really a very, very, very valuable, uh, you know, profession for those that want to put the time and effort into it. But you gotta have tough skin. But there's opportunity there to grow if you're willing to do it. Well, that was a great summary and uh, we're almost out of time. So I just have one other question for all of you. Uh, what is your advice to anyone who is interested in pursuing a career uh, as a construction craft worker? So I'll give you 30 seconds to one minute each. Uh, Nicole, let's start with you. Oh, sorry, I would say develop healthy eating habits. You, like you said, you're outside, you're working in hot and cold, you need to be healthy. You can't just chug a Coke or, I don't know, those monster drinks and think that your body's not gonna break down by the time, I don't know, whatever age you end up being. Yeah, you need to stretch, use your benefits, get the massages, get physio, you need to be healthy. That doesn't necessarily mean go to the gym because work is the gym, but you need to maintain your body. That's a really, really great point. Thank you. Sean, we'll go over to you. Piece of advice. Uh, persevere. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to want to get employed. You're going to knock on a few doors. They're probably not going to be openly. You're going to meet a superintendent that's got a million things on the go that day and uh, uh, maybe not have time for you, but persevere. Keep coming by. Don't, don't take no for an answer and, and uh, keep it. it Again, they're testing you. If, if you're somebody that's going to keep coming back and you're going to want this job and, and work hard, and uh, I'm guilty of that as well. You know, people want to get get on with you, and and you you kind of you see how long how 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 hard they're going to persevere. If they if they want the job, they're going to keep coming back. They're going to keep calling you, and they're going to keep you know 
keep pushing. And then those are the people you want, people who are dedicated and know what they want and are going to fight to, to get it. Right. So that's, that's what we look for. Absolutely. So persevere and don't take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> that, that too. Perfect. Lisa, uh, we'll go over to you. Yeah, just to echo pretty much what Sean said is that, you know, just be just be dedicated and, and understand and have a thick skin and really understand that there are going to be times where people are going to say things to you that may offend you or, or you may take personally. And it's really not about that. Um, it's it's they want you to learn. They want you to do well. They want you to be successful. So you can't really have a chip on your shoulder. I mean, outside of anything that's not appropriate or anything like that. Um, but, you know, there's going to be some harsh tones, there's going to be some yelling, there's going to be some, you know, let's get going. And you know, it's time is money really in construction. So I always tell my young apprentices, please don't go with a chip on your shoulder to a job site, asking like, what is this job site going to do for me? It's what can you do for that job site? So you need to prove yourself and show that you're dedicated, you're there to work, you're there to do an honest day's work for an honest day's pay, and the money will come. That's fantastic. And Sante, we'll give you the last word here. What I would say is, keep keep developing yourself keep improving yourself make yourself more attractive learn to read the drawings come to work every day put in the time and the effort be patient show some compassion because you're getting some direction from some old guys that don't have it and you realize i don't want to be like that i want to treat others better than that so i would just say just keep bettering yourself that's all you can do you make yourself that much more viable to to other opportunities and to other people and companies. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you all so much. That's all the time we had for today. Thank you all for joining us for this episode of the series and be sure to keep an eye out for our next one that will discuss careers in drywall. A recording of this discussion will be posted on Bolt's YouTube channel, as well as the speak out page on our website, boltonline.org. I wanna once again, thank our industry panel who took time out of their very busy days to share their insights, experience, and advice. Thank you so much.